right on this computer. Perfect. All right. So when you first log into Triton Connect, so to get here, you'll first just go to tritonconnect.umsol.edu. At the top, you can see that here highlighted. Um, once you get to the homepage, it'll have you log in using your UMSL credentials. Um, and this should be the homepage that you see. Um, at the top here, we have enter, they can change what is up here. So sometimes these little buttons will change or this little welcome banner will change just kind of depending on what time of year it is, what's going on on campus, things like that. And then we have our upcoming events slider here. This will show you the next eight events that are happening on campus. Um, and then from there, if you would like to view more events, you would just click this view all button here. Um, scrolling down on the homepage, we have more buttons. So this is a link to Sodexo's What's Open, um, a, the link to the shuttle tracker, the link to our event services team's reservation system, Mazevo. Um, and then for students, we have this Canvas login here so they can easily get there if they're on Triton Connect. And also serves as maybe a little reminder that if you're just chilling on Triton Connect and maybe need to get some homework done, that you should click that button there and log into Canvas. Um, and then if you have friends in other departments that have not gotten on to Triton Connect yet, at the very bottom of the homepage, this button right here that's in green, Department Portal Sign Up. Um, if they just click here, it will take them to a Google form to fill out. And that Google form is what tells my team that we need to make a portal for your group on Triton Connect. So when the students are looking for events or anyone really that's looking for events, um, you click that view all button or you could just click the events tab here at the top. Um, it's going to show you all events in chronological order. So you see we have some ongoing events going on right here. Um, so those are all going to be at the top. And then we have today's events. Um, and you also can filter based on what group is hosting it, what group type is hosting it. So if you just want to see what other offices and departments have going on or are posting on here, you can just click that and see what pops up. <clears throat> and then there's different categories that you can um, filter by. So these are important. We'll go over them when you're creating your events. These tags and event types are sometimes what people are searching for events by. Um, so to make them come up more readily available for students in the areas that apply to your event, it is helpful to add these tags and event types um, as it helps them um, find your event easier um, and things like that. You also can filter by location type based off if it's on campus, off campus, or a hybrid event or online only. Um, and then if you wanted to, you can even specify from what date to what date. Um, and then... <clears throat> okay, uh, really quick, we have a question in the yeah. chat about, um, and Katie, maybe you can specify, she asked, would, it, would you recommend organizations get their own page or portal or use the College of Education portal? So, yeah, we have, um, you know, uh, I have the Gateway Writing Project. I know that there are other organizations um, that are community facing organizations, and I'm not sure whether it makes sense for us to have our own gateway writing project page or whether it makes sense for us to do everything through that college of ed page. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, my suggestion is always to look at what the audience that you're trying to reach based on those groups is. If the audience isn't super specific, so for instance, I'll use the College of Business because they have a lot of departments under them, um, and I've worked a lot with them in Triton Connect. Um, they found that instead of maybe having like the, de the finance department and the accounting department um, and the marketing department all as separate entities, at the end of the day, most of the things, the events they're posting in there and the information that they're sending out is applicable to all of the students that would join the College of Business portal. Um, and if it's not, the students that's not applicable to probably will just ignore it anyways. Um, and so in order to not have to track down all of these separate students or all these students to join separate portals um, and be a part of these separate portals, it is easier to have kind of one central location that they're all going to. Um, unless there's like a very specific um, reason or group of people that you're trying to reach. So for instance, under Office of Student Involvement, I have a separate fraternity and sorority life group. Um, and that's because there's a lot of things I need to send to just our fraternity and sorority members and not to every single student that's joined the Office of Student Involvement portal. That makes a lot of sense. I guess I'm wondering about... Um like for alumni or folks who are not currently students, mm -hmm. um, how this information would get to them. Because I, again, I know that this is for student organizations, but I've also was under the impression that it's for like, we can um, 
interact with public, non-students as well. Yep. So when we get to the part where I go over how to create an event in here, there's different settings. You can change it so it can be public or not, or just so um, UM system users can see it. So that would be anyone that has an OMSA login that can log into the system. Um, all those settings are options when you create an event. Um, and then if it's a public facing event, for instance, that you're hosting and you want to send it out to people, um, that link would just take anyone straight to the event page without having to log in. Um, or there's like a QR code that's generated to take them to the event page as well. I know um, the accounting club and then different things that in the College of Business, different events they've had, they've used those QR codes. Um, so even like alumni, people can just walk in the door and scan the QR code to get to the event page and kind of check out the details of the day. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, all right. So <clears throat> for those that maybe want to see what groups are on Triton Connect and kind of check out what else there is on here besides your own department, you would click this group tab up here and then click all groups. And this will give you a list of every single group that has a portal in here. And you also can sort through different group categories um, to kind of filter down your search. And then there's also these different organization types that you can filter through here. Um, if you're wanting to look at your own group's portal, so you're an officer in someone's portal, so let's, we'll just say College of Education, because I think most of you all here are in the College of Education. Um, if you're listed as an officer in a group, it should show up right here. Mine says last seen, but I think it says like my groups or something right here. And then when you click into it, it's going to take you to the dashboard view. So if you're an officer, it's going to take you to this view. Um, and if you're not an officer, it will just take you to the group page and it will kind of show you this information. So it'll show you any events that have happened, the members of the group, the profile picture, what type of group it is, social media links, those types of things. Um, but in the dashboard is going to be where you manage anything on the back end. And so if you need to add officers into your portal so that more people have access to this back end dashboard, that would be you'd scroll down and so you see this brown officers tile and it will take you to this officers page um, and to add an officer basically on any of the pages on Triton Connect on the back end of your portal. If you need to add something, there's going to be a button that's the same coordinating color as the tile was back on the dashboard that says to add member, add officer, create event, create email, those types of things. Um, so add an officer, you would just click this add officer button, and then you would start typing in a name. So for instance, I see Madeline's in here. If I wanted to add her in, I would just click her name, and I can no choose to notify her or not. And then I would just click this add button. And then she would pop up down here, and you can kind of select if they have a specific position. So a lot of times for the campus departments, I've gone in and created a custom position, and then typed in whatever the position for that person is listed on the website. Um, you don't have to do that if it's not, you don't think it's necessary for people looking at your page to know who's what position in the office, but it's helpful for some. Um, if someone's already listed as an officer and you need to remove them as an officer, you would just uncheck this active officer button right here. You can control who shows up as the main point of contact on your page by just clicking or unchecking this box. Um, and then you can choose if that officer is visible publicly on the website in the group page. So let's say, for instance, um, Dorian, who's our director, he wants to have all this back end access, but he doesn't want it to show up that he's an officer in the student involvement portal because he doesn't want people to contact him asking student involvement questions. He wants them to contact Mindy. Um, so we could uncheck this visible publicly um, box for him. <clears throat> if you have a lot of officers in your portal and each of them need to kind of do a different thing. Um, so one of the main examples we use with departments particularly is, so you have a student worker that works at your guys's front desk and you need them to be able to add events for you. You need them to be able to add new members. So maybe you have a little sign up sheet out at one of your events and they put students that want to become a part of the portal, put their name and email down, and you need that student to be able to do that for you and add them as members. On this officers page, there's this permission button right next to the add officers button. When you click into that, it takes you to this screen and you can edit anyone's access. So in that example if I that I just gave, they just need to be able to manage members. So we're going to uncheck send of emails. We're going to uncheck create events. Um, and we're going to uncheck everything except for manage members, probably. Um, maybe you want them to be able to create events. You would leave create events and manage events checked. Um, but you can go through and uncheck and recheck any of these boxes for any of the officers in your portal to kind of manage who can do what in there. 
um, and make sure that things can get done without maybe someone having too much access that you may not want them to have, particularly when we're thinking of student workers for our offices. Um, does anyone have any questions about officers before I move on to just general member? <clears throat> All right, perfect. So back on that dashboard, if you scroll down, there's a blue box that says members. <clears throat> when you click into members, it will take you to this page. Again, like I said, there's a coordinating blue button here that says add member. You can go in and add members this way by starting to type their name like I did for the officers, um, or you can click this paste list button and you can copy and paste emails here. I will say just as a heads up, the emails that Triton Connect recognizes is the SSOID at umsystem.edu. So if you're gonna have someone upload people as members, you're probably gonna want to have them um, work through the spreadsheet or whatever that you had people put their names on first and edit everyone's name so that it says um system as opposed to umsol or mail.umsol or any of the crazy things that we have on our um, emails on campus. So just to know, if you're going to paste the list, the email needs to say at um system and not anything else. Otherwise, it will do an error message. Um, but so then you add the person just by clicking this add button. Again, you can notify them or not. Um, and then it will show you that they're a current member. It has a membership end date. Let's say you know somebody is graduating or they're no longer um, need to be a part of your portal. You can just click this edit button and you just type in a membership end date. Um, <clears throat> you also, not sure what all these settings are. So you can like make it so that certain people can't leave the group or can leave the group. Um, you can make it so people stop receiving emails if someone has complained that they don't want emails, but they still want to be a part of the portal. You could put yes to that right there. Um, but this is how you would look at all of your members as this member page. Um, and a really easy way to send, if you have different types of members in your portal, so you could from right here, um, select just students. Um, and then if you wanted to send an email to students, you would just select all right here and send an email this way. There's also another way to send an email, which I'll go through in a minute. Um, only UMSL, so staff, faculty, students of UMSL can be members on Triton Connect, but there is a way that alumni can have an alumni account. Um, we haven't used it a lot, but I know that there has been some use of it, particularly in College of Business, they've used it um, to have some alumni RSVP to events. So we can mess around with that if that's something that you all are interested in doing. Um, but I know that it's a few extra steps. So it depends on how well your alumni would listen to instructions as far as participating in that part. Um, so this is how you look at your current members. If you do have members that you have done an end date for, you could look at past members. You can look at contacts. So contacts is going to be anyone that has interacted with your portal. So for instance, um, these people probably just went to my pay this Louis Leaders page and were like, what's this? Because it's like a random group. Um, actually, I think I added them as members in one of my trainings in the past is why they're in here. Um, but so they'll show up as contacts, but they're not current members. <clears throat> and I'll show you where that kind of comes into play when we're talking about emails. Um, so since I've just mentioned them a few times already, um, if you're on the dashboard, if you want to send an email to the people in your portal, so you can only email people in your portal. So that'd be anyone on your members list. You're going to click into emails, <clears throat> which is this orange tile. And it's going to take you to this page. If you haven't sent any emails, this is what it'll look like pretty bare. But again, there's that red, orange, whatever color you call this, compose email button. When you click into that, it's going to allow you to select recipients. Um, and so you'll see here, we only have one officer. So if I click on the officer, um, it would let me select him, which would be Louie. He's also a student. So that would be the same person. Um, one thing that we've run into some trouble with is this other contacts button. Like I said, on that members page, there's contacts that have just interacted with your page. So maybe they attended an event you hosted. Maybe they just looked at your page on Triton Connect. We've had some student groups particularly that they'll, they'll click all other contacts. Um, and then these random people who maybe just like stopped by a table that they were hosting or went to a random event that was interesting are now getting like 
frequent emails from this group. So if you want to, if you want to invite people that have attended any event in the past, this other contacts button would be good. I would just suggest if you plan on sending like a newsletter or like a weekly update to not select these other contacts, because these people that are members of your organization have chosen, like, I want more information about this group. I want to stay up to date. These other contacts probably may have just attended event that you hosted and they're not necessarily wanting a bunch of new information. Um, so you select the recipients and then there's this compose email for selected groups button down here. Once you do that, it gives you two options. So you can either use the standard email form, which is the email composer, or you can use the email builder. We've had a lot of success with the email builder in our office. I know um, if you all got that homecoming email that was sent out, I think it was yesterday morning, Mindy actually made that with our email builder. So it's a really easy um, resource to help build like a really cool email. So Obviously, if there was more members, when I had selected all students in our portal, it would pop up all of them here. So if you have 50 people in your thing, it will show 50 people right here. And you can select or unselect anyone that's in that list, and it will just specifically take them out. If you have someone that's not your in your portal, but they said they wanted the um, details of this email. So for instance, let's say... Um, the chancellor, she really wants this email that you're about to send out because it involves something with her, but she doesn't want to be a part of the portal. You could type her email into there and add her as a recipient. You can also CC people or BCC people. <clears throat> and so then once you fill that out, you click this next bottom next button on the bottom right. Um, I know it could be a little tricky. I missed the next button the first time I did this, but um, you just click that next button and you type in the subject line and you can, if you guys have like a generic um, email for your department, you can add it in under your, your portal settings. And then when you click right here, it would pop up as an option. So for instance, in our student involvement portal, I can send an email either from myself or from student involvement at omsol.edu. Um, there's this option to do an introduction. So then if you click one of these, it would say, for instance, when I send out this email, it would say, hi, Katie, and then it would continue the email. Um, depending on which email builder function you choose, um, it may look a little weird because the introduction is always going to be at the top of the email. So if you have a header, it would be above the header, which is a little weird looking. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're going to try and use that. You can just put no introduction. It won't put anything up there. And then you can choose from these templates. So it gives you all these different template designs. Um, I would say one of our probably most frequently used is either this one one columns with the left sidebar or the basic one column template. Um, so you'll see if I click into that, it'll take me automatically to the design. Um, anything that's already, any widgets that are already there, you can just click edit widget and it will open up on the right hand side, um, the different things you can edit. So here I can upload a photo, I can put a link URL and I can include that alternative text, um, for the image that will help, um, people that have screen readers. Um, that may not be able to read the font on their own or see the image on their own. Um, and then same thing with these text boxes, pops open. It gives you all these different options to edit the text up here, just like a normal text box would in any other program you're using. Um, and if you need to add something, for instance, maybe I want to add an upcoming event that I have, I can go ahead and drop that in here. And then it will let me select the upcoming event from our events list. Um, so you can add that in there. Um, and then the event would just, there would be a link directly to the event there. Um, you can also do that in the form of click boxes on the next page, but there's not a lot of controlling where the check boxes or the click boxes show up in your email unless you do it on the design part. So just to keep that in mind. And then on the delivery page, you can send yourself a test email. You can preview it first and you can also schedule when that email will be sent, which is very helpful. And you also can save drafts in your portal as well. So maybe one of you needs to type the email and then someone else needs to proofread it or something like that. You can save a draft and have them go in there and try and look at the email. So that's super helpful. And we found a lot of success with these emails. Um, and it's really just like an easy way to set up an email that looks cool and fun for students um, that maybe they will read as opposed to our normal word emails. Um, any questions so far? Michaela, do you mind if I pop in really quick? Yeah. I think I am the biggest supporter of the email builder because um, there's also, the, you don't have to send the email through Triton Connect. So you can see on this page, if you want to send it through Triton Connect, you great, you save and send. What I've been doing, which if you've seen any 
um, like the homecoming email or any email that I send out campus wide, I do that, um, like send myself a test email and it sends it to me where it looks like a nice structured, professionally put together bulletin. <laughs> and it sends me the email. I'm able to add the little email student involvement. I'm sold at ED with questions at the top. I'm able to move things a little bit there. And then that's what I submit for the all campus email. So it's not even through Triton Connect. Try and Connect just helped me build it. And we were having the darndest time sending all campus emails that we'd spend hours working on the format and trying to make it look nice. And then the minute it got sent out, it was like, well, that didn't work. So this, it's just, it's put together. It looks like you've used a professional um, like publication software and it's really, so I don't necessarily send emails through the email builder. <laughs> I create the email and then send myself a, a test and use that as an email. So there's a few functions of the email builder, but it is slick. If I'm able to do it, anyone is able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if, if someone reminds me at the end, I can pull up one of those homecoming emails that Mindy sent out so we can see kind of what it looks like in the actual email. Um, so probably one of the main functions that people are using on Triton Connect student orgs and departments alike is going to be this events tab. Um, so when you're on the dashboard, it's always going to be a green tile that says events on it. When you click into it, it will take you to your upcoming events. If you need to see past events that you've hosted, you can click that in this left menu. You can see drafted events and you can see deleted events. Um, and you can also create event templates, which I'll show in a minute. Um, but on all of these pages, there's always going to be a green create event button. Um, when you click into that, it normally on the first time you make an event, if you don't have any templates, it will always just say blank, blank event template. If you make a template, which I'll show you at the end of the event creation thing, you can save a template and then it will show up as the template. So <clears throat> you click blank event template. It's going to ask you basic information. So it's going to ask you the event name a description of your event, what type of event it is. So if you'll remember when I was on that event page, um, it was asking, or there was filters for what event type and event tag. So this is where it's helpful for your event to show up. Um, so you're gonna wanna make sure this event type specifically, since it's a required one, is very accurate to whatever it is. So, oh, excuse me, let's say you're hosting a training, you're gonna wanna make sure it says training and then event tags. <clears throat> if it's a career development training, select career development and you can always select more than one <clears throat> so if you're if this is something that's engaging the community so maybe you're doing a training where people from different businesses in the community are coming in and they're talking about how they got to the place they are in their careers you could do that community engagement tag um if it's an event where someone can just drop in and kind of hear what they want and leave whenever they want that's a good tag um if there's entertainment our fan favorites on campus is going to be the free event, free food tags. Um, if there's free food, I guarantee students will come. And so they even sort this events list by the tag free food and giveaways and prizes. That's like the two top, I would say the three top ones. Um, so if you're going to have food at your event, make sure you click free food because it will bring more students there. Um, if it's a leadership op event, different things like that. If they're going to do service there, if it's specifically for student organizations or students who are parents, different events like that, just select as many event tags as apply to the event. And then you'll move on and it has the event coordinator. So this is always going to show up as the person who's creating the event. Um, if you need it to be someone else, if there's multiple officers in your portal, you can select from this drop down. There'll be all of your officers listed here. Um, and then you also can add team members. So if you're going to be using the check-in feature of events, um, you're always going to want to make sure you add team members because anyone added as a team member is going to be the people that can add attendance physically on their own Triton Connect app. Um, if they're not listed here, they won't be able to add attendance. Um, if your plan is to always do kind of a paper and pen attendance and have someone, a student or someone go in on the back end and add attendance, this isn't too important. Um, but if you do want to work towards using that Triton Connect app to do check-in, um, this team members button is important. So you just click that add button, start typing, and then you can add anyone you want as a team member, and then they will be able to do check-in for you. <clears throat> um, you can select how you want attendees to contact you. So there is an option on every event posting um, that says contact the host. Um, and so they can either start a group chat with everyone that's listed here, or it can just send an email to the person that's listed as the event coordinator. That's up to you all. You can choose that for yourselves. 
um, start date of your event, start time, end date, end time, and then you can do custom time instructions. So maybe check-in is from 8 to 8.30. The actual event is from 8.30 to 10. Um, and you want to make sure that your um, attendees know that. You could add custom time instructions here and it just shows up on the event page, whatever you type here. Um, if there's a recurring event, this is one of my favorite features in our past system. It wasn't a very easy way to click a recurring event. On this system, if your event is recurring, you can literally ad hoc select any of these random dates and it will show up on those dates as separate events. So that's really helpful. Um, I know in the past it's been, honestly, most systems, it's really hard to add recurring events. So um, this is very helpful. You can just go through and select all of those. So say you have like a general body meeting um, with one of your student groups that comes out of your organization or things like that. You can just select all of the dates of that coming up or maybe a training that you all host, those types of things. You can select all of the dates that apply and you can collapse that or just scroll down. It's gonna ask you where the event is. So if it's on campus, off campus, online only, you can type in the location name here. If it's to be determined, so you don't quite have the location ready to go, um, maybe you're waiting on the Zoom link for someone or something like that, you can just click this TBD event or checkbox and then it will leave it. It will say TBD on the thing. If you want a specific address, you can go ahead and add that in here. Um, <clears throat> and then you can choose who can see the event location. So for instance, whenever we do a training that involves a Zoom link, we often choose this only display the location to logged on users, or if we're gonna be more specific, we can do it to whoever is registered. So that means anyone can see my event. If I said it that way, this doesn't deter who can, or this doesn't determine who can see it. It just determines who can see the event location. So particularly with Zoom, so we can avoid Zoom bombers. It's always the best to do logged on users, if not registered users, because um, then that makes sure you know that only the people who actually have registered for your event can see the Zoom link, or at least only faculty, staff, and students at home are the people that can see your link. Um, you can put the meeting link here. It will automatically populate where the meeting is from normally. If not, you can select that app there. Um, and then you can also, if you want the link to say, or you want the location to say, um, like if it's a hybrid event, for instance, and you want the location to say, um, South Campus Classroom Building number 215, and then there's also a link for the Zoom people. You can choose who can see the meeting link specifically so that people don't have to register to know that they can go to that South Campus Classroom Building, but if they want to do the Zoom option, they do have to register. You can choose that accordingly. Um, here's where you would add the flyer, um, and so in the event photo. So the event photo is what's gonna show up in those little boxes when we're on the events page. I think I went off of the event page, but we'll go back there. Um, it's gonna be this little square that shows up on the left-hand side once the page loads. That's gonna be your event photo. Um, your event flyer is gonna be what shows up if we do the calendar view of the events page, which is over here. I'm not sure a lot of people use this view, but if they do, you'll see if you hover over an event, some of them, I'm not sure, people haven't added. If there was a flyer added, it would pop up when I hover over the event here. Um, so that's the difference between the photo and the flyer. It has listed here what the best um, size is for that picture for the photo. Um, and then moving on, you can add more attachments. Some people have actually been using this food provided button and then specifying what type of food has been provided. It's cool. Some people might be interested. If it's not a big deal, then it's not a big deal. You don't have to add it. Um, okay, here's where we get to the access and display option. So you can choose who's allowed to register um, and you can choose who can see the event. So maybe you want everyone to be able to see the event because maybe you want new students who are touring, who hear that we have Triton Connect. If they go to see like, what's this Triton Connect thing about? They could, or your alumni, they could see like, oh, College of Ed has this really cool event coming up, but then maybe they can't register because they're not a University of Missouri user uh, or campus groups user. Um, so <clears throat> making sure whoever is allowed to register is specific to whoever you want it to be. Um, so a lot of times if you want it to show to everyone that's like logged in, this would just be the University of Missouri St. Louis campus groups users only. Um, you can click here and choose if you just want it to show up to students or just staff and faculty. Um, 
You can do just your group members. So anyone that's in your portal, if you just wanted to show up to them, you can select group members only. You could do some group members only. So maybe that's officers, maybe that's students, staff, or faculty. You can select those all here. Um, those are the, I would say the most important ones. If there's questions about other ones, um, you can also do officers only. Um, if there's questions about other ones, feel free to let me know and I can answer them. Um, you also can select if there's someone registered to another event at the same time to not have them register to the event. Um, the only place that that kind of gets tricky is with those, for instance, those ongoing events, so our homecoming service project. Um, if someone was to have registered to that event to make sure they were reminded that that event was happening, um, they would also not be able to register to your event because the homecoming service project is going on this whole month. So if your event was at that same time, um, it wouldn't allow them to register for it. Again, for who can see this event, you can do everyone, logged on users only, group members only is going to be, again, the people that are only a part of your portal. Um, and then if you just want it to be whatever you selected up here, if you got very specific with that, you can just say just the people who are allowed to register. Um, and then there is this no one option. I know, for instance, the Triton Pantry, they have um, they use Triton Connect events to track attendance so they know how many students they're serving. Um, they also use it to kind of keep track, like maybe there's a student who's using the pantry a lot more than they have in the past. Is there something wrong? Do we need to check in on them? Um, but they don't have those events posted on the calendar because essentially it's almost every day. They just have it posted so they can use it on the back end for tracking attendance. So they have it selected as no one can see the event. Um, and then you can choose if you want it to show up on the upcoming event slider or not. I can't think of an example when you wouldn't want it to show up there, but most of the, that option is there if you want it to. Um, if you don't want people to register the event, you can just select this as no. Um, just make sure that if up here for the location, you said only registered people, you're going to want to make sure that this registration says yes. Um, and then you can choose to close the event registration. So if there's like the spots are full or things like that, and you can also... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, you can also control how many people can register, but that's farther down. Um, oh yeah, the attendance limit. So you can um, choose how many people can register there. Um, I'm trying to think through. So for some reason, under these settings down here, there's this option to send a reminder email to people that are attending or have registered for your event. For some reason, it's automatically always checked to yes. So if you don't want them to get a reminder email about your event, just make sure to always click this and unselect the send reminder. Um, it is nice if you make the event and for instance, our university programming board, they'll make their events and they'll just change this to say like, we're so excited to see you at our bingo night on Friday or our bingo night, exclamation point. And then they can just create the event and totally forget about it. But the day before their event, anyone who was interested in the event is going to get an email that reminds them like, hey, UPP is having this event you signed up for. Don't forget to go. Um, so it is a useful tool. But just as a heads up, it's always selected to send a reminder. So if you do not want it to send a reminder, make sure to unselect that. Um, and then you can change what email confirmation people get when they RSVP or you can turn it off. Um, you can choose who can see the display list of, or who can see the list of attendees that have registered for your event. Um, a lot of times I'll select nobody, but I don't think a lot of people are like creeping on the events to see who's going and who's not. Um, there's positives and negatives to both options. So just whatever you think is best for you all in your event. Um, and then also it's always automatically selects to send a feedback request within 24 hours after your event. So if you've checked into one of our events or anyone's events and you've gotten a weird email that was like, how do you rate this event? That's why they probably just didn't notice that they needed to unselect this if they didn't want feedback, or maybe they were doing wanting feedback. And you do have the cool option if you want to send a feedback request. Um, if you don't add anything here, it will just ask them to rate it like one through five stars. And that's the email when they click on the link, it just says like one through five stars and you can add a comment. Um, but if you want to ask more specific questions for assessment purposes, you can create a form or survey, which I can walk through really quick um, in a second. And then here you would just select whatever survey you've created in your portal, and then it will automatically send them a link to that survey. Um, and then there's some advanced options. So if you're going to be tracking attendance, I always, for this um, check-in method, I always just select both methods at the same time. 
Um, there's a few options there. Like you can make it so people can check in multiple times to your event if that's needed for you. You can have them be able to check out if that's helpful. Um, and then if you do have the multiple check-ins, you can change it to like, they can only check in multiple times within a this many minute period. So if they checked in at 1210, they can't check back in until 1215 or 1225, things like that. <clears throat> um, if you have a speaker that you want to shout out, you can just add a speaker here, just like ask for some of their basic information. Um, could be a cool option if you have like a cool speaker coming. You can do the same thing with sponsors if you have an event sponsor. Um, if you have a URL link that they need to re be redirected to for some reason after they register to your event, you can put that here. So a good example of this is, for instance, with Chili Feed, which is tomorrow. Um, we sell tickets through the Sodexo website, right? So a student could register to our event we have for Chili Feed on here, but even if they register, that doesn't mean they have a ticket. So we can set it up so that this redirect URL, as soon as they click register, it sends them to the link that says like, we have you have to buy a ticket to attend this event. And then they can buy the ticket right there. That can be very helpful. Um, you can assign a parent event. Um, so if there's like a group of events, for instance, College of Business, they hosted Ethics Day. They had about five sessions that they posted as separate events in here, um, but they created the Ethics Day parent event. So they all went back to that event. And if you just clicked on Ethics Day, you could see all five of the sessions that were hosted within that event. You can set it so they automatically register to other events. So let's say you um, host like a monthly training that you need the students who attend the first one, they have to keep coming or they should keep coming to the other sessions you have the other months, you can make it so that they are automatically registered to um, the upcoming events. And it will have a list of the upcoming events here and you just check them off. So for instance, we have a student org training that they all have to attend. Um, and so if they registered to our student org leadership education training at the beginning of the semester, I had it so it automatically registered them to all of our training sessions following so that they at least knew where it was and it was on their calendars. Um, yeah. They got a notification. Oh, um, some train connect. Um, and then... If there's a co-host, you add them under here. Under co-host, you just like look through these different options. So if it was an officer department, you could go here and you could say that we're hosting the, this with the College of Nursing. Um, so that's how you add a co-host. And then if you want this to be an event template. So for instance, my student work training that's repetitive, I wanted it to be an event template. So most of my settings were saved. So I didn't have to do edit all of those settings every single time. I would just click for this group. And when I click create event, it creates the template for me. Um, so I'm gonna put no for now. And then you would just click create event. And once it loads, it'll show you this little, well, this is cause it's a student org. Um, it asks this, but if you're doing it in your office or department's portal, it will not ask you these questions. Submit. <clears throat> um, then you just click view events and it should pop up there. So we'll have your picture. It will tell you when it is. Um, and then it will, it won't say pending approval. Campus offices and apartments don't have to get their events approved, uh, but student groups do. That's why that's here. Um, but it has the event tags and it says how many people are registered. And then this sales will be how many people are checked in. It normally changes to say checked in once there's people checked into that event. Um, but if I were to have created a template, so for instance, this template, when I click into it, it has my event name description blank, but then the type in all my category or my tags are still there and the event coordinator is there. Um, and then it just has me edit the details that are probably what need to be edited. So it still says it's on campus. Um, it still like has my settings saved for who can see everything and the picture, all of those things are all saved because I have a template. So if I would have at the bottom again, went to event template and said for this group and then create event, that's how you get the event template to show up. And you can always view those templates by going to the left-hand menu and clicking templates. Um, so that is how you do the events. Um, and then just really quickly before I open it up for questions, lastly on the dashboard in a purple box is the surveys and forms. Um, these get very specific to what type of form or survey you're trying to create. So I'm not going to walk through those. Um, but if there's interest, I could host a um, like surveys and forms session or just 
hop on a Zoom call and meet with you to help set up whatever form you're hoping to set up. Um, but so you just click that create button in the top right hand corner. It gives you all these options. I would say form or survey is probably the most likely one that will get used. Um, and then it just pops up in this blank form. You can edit the title here, similar to like a Google Doc. Um, you can also edit titles here, similar to like a Google form. Um, and then to add things, you just click add question. And all of these different boxes are different types of questions that you can create. Um, so that's why I said it gets very in the weeds with these surveys and forms. But there is a ton of options to create forms. Um, I specifically have done a lot of different forms and surveys on here. Um, so that's why I said if we want to get in the weeds at another time, we can, but I'm not going to just for right now, um, just for the sake of opening it up to questions. So what questions do we have? I just wanted to quickly make the blank statement that Michaela just went through a lot of stuff, a lot of advanced settings. Once you get in there, it's honestly very intuitive and you don't even have to do all of those advanced settings. A lot of times I'll just do the, I here's just the date, the photo, the time, blah, blah, blah. I don't set anything else up. So just yep. know you can get as detailed as you want, but it, it's honestly pretty. And I know I joked earlier, but if I can do it, anyone can do it. Like you're not going to mess anything up because it kind of like talks you through it. So I know all of those details. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm already so confused. It, it It's not as bad when you're actually doing it. Yep. And so I would say just do the basic info. And then if you don't want it to send a reminder and you don't want to send a 24 hour feedback form, just make sure to unselect those. But other than that, it's usually just the basic info on events that is filled in. I just go through all those settings so that you all know, like there is a, a depth of knowledge that this system has that you can use if you need it for that. But if you don't, most people just post simple details in their events. So, yeah. So I have a, a couple of questions. One, um, this is, if correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the thing where if you create an event here in Triton Connect, it's going to go automatically to the UMSL calendar and then automatically to the Community Connect. Is that right? I know for sure it goes to the calendar. Mindy, do you know about the Community Connect? Um, yes, is Patricia still on here? Patricia no, had set that up. So according to her, that is what's happening. Okay. Um, then my other question is, what if you want to create an event where there's a registration fee? Yeah, so in the event thing, I'm not sure. So there is an option to like sell a ticket in here, but we don't have like... um web apps connected or like triton net we don't have any of that connected to the system um so like you could put here that there is a cost so for price like you could add like let's say it's ten dollars um you could do that <clears throat> um and then i think the best way to go about it would be that redirect url um so if there's like a place that you're selling the tickets um to redirect them to like that page so they can buy the tickets there because we don't have like a money management system in here well there is one for student groups but it's like technically not actual money <laughs> yeah okay um and then i guess the other thing is just when i think about i mean this seems really cool and like lots of automated stuff which would make it super user friendly but when I think about the people who I'm most likely going to be advertising events to, mm -hmm. it's majority people who are not UM system people, which that just means I have to have it open to everyone. There's no way for me to put in like a an email list of non UM system people. Is that correct? if you want them to be members if you want to just send like an email to those people you could add them in that like um box that allows you to add extra people um but there is also an option where alumni can like create a profile and join a portal um if it's not alumni that you're specifically talking about though um let me sorry let me get to that page really quick um so this add more recipients um, button, you can just type in emails here um, that it would send to. 
Um, so you could, I'm assuming, copy and paste a long list if you have it. Um, but if you were wanting to just promote um, the, like an event or something, um, it would be difficult for them to, unless it's just open to everyone, it would be difficult for them to see it. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Alexandra, I know you had to hop on a little bit late. Is there something you didn't see that you were hoping to see? Oh no. Um, from what I from what I have have um reviewed with you, you you've covered everything really well, and I learned some new things from um that you didn't cover the last time I went to one of your sessions. Oh, perfect. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions? If not, I'm more than happy to give you all 11 minutes back in your day. All right. Well, let me stop recording really quick.